hurrah for the technology. Hopefully we'll get that working again for other speakers. I'm, I'm less bothered because I've spoken in front of audiences on and off for many decades now. So hopefully we'll now have something that doesn't have slides but will have what you need in terms of description. And of course today I'm so thankful to be here. Fantastic team that we're with. And it's always an honour and a privilege to be at these sort of events and at the cutting edge, the pioneering edge of the sort of work that church is now doing. And this particular speech is about churches and communities as safer spaces. No such thing as a truly safe space, of course, but safer spaces for people like us, for people who are no neurodivergent. Uh, I am Anne Memmott. Just in case you didn't know or didn't catch that to start with, I'm disabled, I'm autistic, I've also been the author of the National Autism Guidelines, which are currently hosted, and I'm very thankful for this, by an Oxford Diocese, but which also help inform various other policies and reports within the church. And I work together with a brilliant team for that, including some of the big charities. <coughs> When we're talking about neurodiversity, I wonder what you do mean. Oh, hello, are we all? Oh, hurrah! Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you, God. Neurodiversity, and of course, we're talking about different neurotypes, mostly with this. So we're talking about autism. A lot of people think that is neurodiversity. Of course it isn't, it's just part of it. We're talking about dyspraxia, ADHD, Tourette's, dyslexia, many other forms of neurodiversity are now being discovered, now being taken seriously, thank goodness. And we're looking, of course, at these as being different, not broken so important that when we're in church context that we have churches that are responsive to this and realising that people, although they may have their own personal views of their circumstance, what we mustn't do as churches is go up to them and go, oh I'm so sorry. <laughs> and that was the first thing anyone said to me when I disclosed. I am so sorry, I will pray for you. <laughs> I was, I didn't know what to do with myself in that moment because it wasn't where I was. I was actually okay because for me it had given me answers. It had explained a lot about myself that I was autistic. And goodness me was I ever autistic, but no one had realised because they weren't looking for women, they weren't looking for anyone in fact, who wasn't young and male, preferably white, definitely introverted, yet all the myths, every myth you can imagine. And I didn't fit many of those stereotypes. But we also need safety, we need belonging. Now, the Bible is absolutely filled with the most brilliant passages. Oh, hello, we've got a slightly different order here, uh, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, I'm going to start with that one. Psalm 23. We probably know this, I'm not going to read the whole thing to you, but for me it's just so lovely to think of God as being someone who is there to care, someone who is there for everyone, not just particular people in a flock. Someone who is going to prepare a table before us filled with the things that we need, not just what everyone else needs. And someone who is going to meet make sure we are safe, make sure that we are secure, that we are fully engaged, fully included in that kingdom. So that model for safety and inclusion is really important, I think. Moving back to that one, just a little bit about autism for those that aren't so sure, because although many of us, of course, do know this topic, some might not be completely up to date on the latest research, and we'll hear from various other speakers today who'll have their own take on this. But it is a neurodiversity, a neurodivergence, if you prefer. We're born autistic, we're autistic for life. Nothing is going to change that, although various different therapies attempt to make us 
months get attempt to make us pretend we're not. Not a very healthy psychological approach at all. Many of us have a different way of communicating, and naturally we do communicate differently. And I'll talk about it more this afternoon in the workshop. Sensory profile, very important for many of us, where a good 80-90% of people who are autistic will also have differences in the way they process sound, differences in the way they process light, and various other senses. And most importantly, we know that this is all genders, all ages, all personalities, not just introverts, a lot of us are extrovert, all IQs. And in fact, we found out that only 15% of autistic people are currently registered as having a lower IQ. So that's vastly different from what we understood even a short time ago. All sorts of abilities, all levels of support needs, and those vary, of course, from circumstance to circumstance. And the photo I've shown here is a photo of a number of older people of various different ethnicities and genders. And that is as representative of autism as any other photo you'll see. And we tend not to think of it that way, of course. It was so caught up with this idea of being young boys. And then we sort of went, oh, maybe it's young girls. Goodness me, there's one or two females who are old. What are we going to do? But it isn't. It's every age, every age of person. And so little research has happened on many of those groups. What does it mean? to be autistic and to read parts of the Bible, like Psalm 23, that talk about comfort and safety and belonging. Well, for me, it is about that banquet for all. It's about knowing that we can have the things that we need. Surely one of the things that we most definitely need is the ability to go into faith groups and not be targeted, but that hasn't been given. Because we've had, unfortunately, this very interesting, and I use the word interesting in its, in its most loose sense, circumstance where we've had this huge inquiry with the IICSA, which have been looking at churches and safeguarding. And one of the statistics in there stopped me in my tracks. Because we have realized from this, it's in this report, background report, that just about 50% of the children and young people that were targeted, that were brought out in this report, had been either disabled or neurodivergent. So this huge targeting, obviously by a tiny minority, but huge targeting specifically of these vulnerable groups. So our churches really do have to think carefully about the narrative, think carefully about what they're saying from the front and everywhere else about safety, about respect, and about responsibility. And certainly I want to see far, far more done from the centre, which is another story, I won't go into it here, but they've not yet wanted to engage with this. And I think it's very good if they start to do so. Those needs for churches and communities to be safe havens, so what can we do? Well, for a start, we can partner which is what we're doing here. We're not being done to by non-disabled, non-neurodivergent people. We're leading this conference, this is our conference. And yes, we're blessed indeed by those around us who have the space and time to, to enable that. Uh, we can co-produce. We can love in the safest possible way. And we can care as equals. There's a lovely little thing I found on the internet. I won't claim that I have done this, but it's about friendship. Friends who believe in you, friends who make you laugh, comfort you, chill with you, understand you, help you, play with you, stick up for you, trust you. How much do we trust people who are neurodivergent? That trust has to be there. We can also make sure we're commissioning training in some authentic way from people who are neurodivergent. Because at the moment we've got too much that's being done by other people for us without us. And we've seen even some of the very big conferences this year, national conferences, trying to do just that. We didn't get away with it because
because we're starting to get quite assertive, shall we say, and say, no, no, you're not. Well, oh, goodness me, we need to do better than that. We can respect that there's different communication and friendship styles without having to say it's wrong. Glad of Dan talking about some of his experiences there. And we can also respect that we have different expressions of, for example, pain and grief and fear without having to get books thrown at us saying toxic people and how to deal with them. I actually had someone give me that, just in case it helped. It didn't help me at all. <laughs> I don't know what it did for them. We don't need that. It's not important to start branding people as toxic. What does that say about trust and love and togetherness and friendship? Nothing. And we can make it safe to disclose because we have so many people who are still in our church structures who, if they do know their neurodivergent, they don't say. No way can they say. And again, we've heard a little from Dan as to what the obstacles, the obstructions that could be there. And some families, certainly church families, have gone to such lengths to disguise the fact that they have, for example, autistic children. Oh, they're not really autistic, no, they're just a bit quirky. Oh, no one, no one has mentioned the word. We've got to move away from that thinking. Every person is wonderfully made with the light of God within them. Every single person. More information are plenty today. It has been a pleasure to speak with you. We're very glad to talk to people as long as we've got the proverbial spoons to do so. If at any stage you try to talk to me and I run off, it's nothing personal. I will just need a little bit of me space. I'll find you later. But thank you so much.